I was born in 1944 in Clarksdorp in the Western Transvaal. And in our town, it wasn't a city, there was a convent which my grandfather, my German grandfather, had helped establish in the sense that he built the altar in the chapel out of wood. He was, his sister was the 19th sister in our original house in, Al in Germany. Yes, in Augsburg. So he came, he fo she came out here and then he followed her. So he was in the East London, Port Elizabeth area using his skills, which were carpentry, in about the 19, uh, 1890s. And he met my grandmother, who was an Irish uh, teacher, and they got married, and they came to live in Clarkstall. That was roughly in, um, keep getting the centuries wrong, in about 1898. And as I say, we were very close to the sisters because he had the sister who was one of our sisters. And um, I grew up visiting the convent regularly with my parents. They were very close to us and we were close to the sisters and we did lots of odd jobs. My mum and dad had 13 children and so my father had a combi and he used to go and fetch the sisters when drive-in movies first started and exposed them to that. So when I came to Whitbank, there was a very similar atmosphere. I knew how the sisters lived and worked and prayed because I'd been to school all my life at Clarkstrup Convent to these very same Dominican sisters. I knew when I was in grade three or standard one, as it was then called, that I wanted to be a sister. But I always fought against it because it wasn't very fashionable among um, South African girls to enter the convent. So I didn't immediately enter the convent after I'd matriculated. I went to university, I went to WITS, and um, I started teaching in various government schools. I had to teach back my contract because that's the way I'd got educated, by going to university at the expense of the government in those days and then one had to pay back for three years. And the, nag the nag niggly feeling that I actually needed to be a sister kept on in spite of all the other adventures I was having. And eventually I, uh, applied, I went to the convent and I became a sister. And I knew then that I was in the right place. And I've taught in many of our convents. I've been in Springs and in Balcom. But before I came to Whitbank, I was actually on a mission in Venda for two years because I think I had rather grandiose ideas that I would be saving the whole world by going on to the mission. And it was very, very tough. It wasn't where our sisters were. Our sisters were in the school up at a place called Chitali just to the east of uh, Sukhmankar. It was terribly tough there. The roads were bad and we had to have a generator and it was switched off at a certain time. I was studying and I did um, theology and uh, I, nevertheless I got the degree and then I went on and I also did a Masters of Theology. but. Uh, after I'd been there for two years, one of our superiors got hold of me and said, you know, we need you in Whitbank because we need a principal there. So I did nothing about applying for a job. But I was actually very grateful because life on the mission was terribly tough. I lived with the sisters in our convent there, but I went out every day in a second-hand folksy to teach except when the rain was so bad that the roads were totally unnegotiable. I came here and what, had, what stood me in good stead was my knowledge of government schools because I was teaching in government schools before I became a sister. And I knew the practices there that worked. 
The difference here was that the kids were, I'd also been in Springs at Valcom, but the, the children were so much more open to our teaching and we had very few discipline problems. So I actually loved it and uh, the first few years my office was over there where the high school complex is or was. I'm not too sure because I can see things have changed here. And uh, that was where my office was. And this building where I'm being interviewed was actually where the sisters lived. We lived upstairs in little cubicles which were separated by kind of hardboard. And um, I, however, was lucky enough to be in the room right in front at the top of the school below the cross where Pat Barnes has her office now. It was a bitterly cold room as was the office downstairs where Kirsten Barnes has her office now. But um, those were, I was younger and much younger and it was, we somehow could cope with it. And there was a sense of joy and fun and we, there was always joy and fun among the sisters. We went across the road regularly for um, masses and church and at the time I also was, had what was called um, the guitar group in the music rooms which now have been removed there but behind me <laughs> where I'm sitting are newer rooms and some of the older rooms there were the music rooms. And I used to go and practice with the children who, it was really just chords. But with us was Sister Dietmund who played, this was a very musical school and we had several music teachers and Sister Dietmund played the organ. So when you couldn't play an F sharp minor on the guitar, she <laughs> carried it on the organ. And I must say, I loved those masses. There was a tremendous atmosphere I thought, and the children liked them too. One of the hard things was when we decided to, to take boys. There was a need for boys to have the same sort of education, and in Whitbank there was no such school. So um, the board weren't very open initially because they thought the boys would get older and create havoc, um, but we, we took them, and I think in the long run it was a success. And another thing which was very hard, which was even before the boys, was it was in, I came here in 1989, and Catholic schools had opened doors to all uh, denominations and religions and um, also colors. So a lot of the Catholic folk left us um, and took their children to government schools because they didn't like the population imbalance as they saw it. But because our school had such a good name and achieved such good results, they started drifting back again. And it's become a very, I think, successful school. It has a, an excellent name. And um, I'm delighted to be here today and to see all the things that have changed and developed. I can hear the marimbas in the background and one of the years when I was here near the beginning a donor gave us some money and I got some marimbas from the Transkai. We bought them and they came here and the children started learning marimbas and I, as, I, as far as I know the marimbas are a big feature of the school and do very well and the children love playing them. I think it's a happy school. When we sisters lived upstairs, um, we had lots of perks in that we were right here where the school was. There were sometimes some negative perks because I had to open up the school in the holidays for the women who came to clean it and all that. And I remember arriving here after travelling from Venda. It was a long journey in a combi. Uh, packed with my belongings and our driver from the mission came too and the sisters were so gracious to him. Sister Lucia was here as the prioress and she let him sleep there at the back near the music rooms where there's a, a bed 
and um, I was exhausted, so I went to sleep. But early the next morning, Sister Charlotte, who was the sister who worked in the kitchen, knocked on my door and she said, come, 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 the women are here. You must tell them what to do. And the cleaners had arrived, so I had rather a sudden introduction to <laughs> the cleaning staff. And um, that carried on until we got somebody to, to help us with that sort of thing. And I was very grateful when we got that. We also had quite a few break-ins into the building itself, not so much with the common part, but the, where the classrooms were. And um, after we'd been here for a few years, we, the sisters, all but four of them, moved to uh, Duncan Street, 58 Duncan Street, where we'd bought a house, four of us. And the very first time I had a bath there was in a mor one morning after we got there and I locked the door. And unbeknown to me, I couldn't unlock the door. So when I had finished having a bath and wanted to come out, I couldn't. Um, luckily there was a, a sister in the house called, called Sister Consuela, long dead now, also a music teacher. But she came um, down here, or she actually came to Hans Fulmer, who's one of the people who's been very instrumental at our school, and uh, said, come, come help. So the next thing there was a knock on the bathroom door, and here he was. I was so grateful that she heard me, because I was crying out from the bathroom, please come and help. But after that, we never locked the bathroom door, but we had the lock repaired. <laughs> So that was a, f a funny introduction to that house in Duncan Street, but uh, we loved it. And I was just thinking this morning, I drove past there on purpose, and I noticed there's a, a concrete wall there now, uh, you know, those prefab or concrete slats. And I thought to myself, um, all of them who lived there with me are dead. Sister Dietmund, Sister Teresa, and Sister Helga, the four of us lived there. And it was a big change, especially for the older ones, from the regular convent with lots of sisters. And we took the older sisters um, down to various retirement homes. Uh, some of them weren't very happy at all. It's very hard when you're a sister to suddenly retire. And so we go on <laughs> virtually until we drop or until we <laughs> rendered incapable because of sickness or something. Yeah, th there was a lot of um, camaraderie and we got, I think we got to know the staff well and they were kind and good to us and we tried to be the same to them. I think it was just natural and you got closer to some than to others and to some children than to others. And of course there were not only easy things, there were times which were very, very difficult. But um, somehow we got through it, and I'm glad to see that the school has survived as well as it has, and done as well as it has. And, you know, I remember every nook and cranny, there used to be a passage here where I'm sitting, where we came, when we came out of our morning prayer in church. And I had to hurry, because I had to get to uh, the road there and unlock all the classrooms. But when you're a sister, it's the older sisters who must come out of the chapel first. And there was one who I thought did it on purpose because she used to waddle like this. Dip, dip. And as you can see, this passage isn't that wide. And I tried and duck past her here and it didn't work. And then I tried to duck past her the other side and it didn't work. But anyway, and um, Sister Charlotte used to get cross with with us if we didn't come to lunch on time because she cooked lunch for a big community of 16 sisters or more and she used to come over and say will you come and I'd be in the middle of extra maths or something <laughs> I'd say I'm coming sister but she she didn't understand that you know so that was at times a bit difficult. I did know Father Schmidt um, you mentioned him earlier I, I liked him I think his name was Gebhard and we called him Geb and he was kind to us in the sense that he would 
he loved, he loved going to tour the Eastern Transvaal and he'd pack us in his car, a few of us, and you know, we'd go to God's window and all places like that in the holidays. Um, we also had a lot of different priests in my time. Some of them were very straight-laced. <laughs> I won't mention the name of one who um, wasn't too pro-feminism. And I was. And, and, you know, I said to the girls, God isn't necessarily a male. God can be a female. And God is, a, you know, neither male nor female. God is everything to all of us. So I took that uh, story in the Bible from, you know, where they compare God to a mother hen who gathers her chickens under her wings. And so he took me, this priest took me to the bishop. And uh, I had to sit down there and he, the bishop said, yes, yes, Father. He said, she's teaching the children that God is a cuckoo. You know, because, <laughs> but the priest happened to be um, where, uh, of the, you know, he understood the word cuckoo, the bishop, I mean. And uh, so that was a whole scene, and that never, and um, that was hard. I also remember I was asked to be um, a communion minister, or oh, yes, I was, and at, when it came to communion, we were asked to come up and take the hosts and go to the people and give them out. And there was a lady here whose name shall be not mentioned. I don't even know if she's alive. But she was a, a, a laywoman who was in charge of all these communion ministers. And she, we, we had by that time, no long, we no longer wore our habits and veils. And she used to get so, she said to me, Sister Margaret, if you don't wear your habit, you can't be a communion minister. And so eventually I was asked not to be a communion minister. But, uh, you know, those were the injustices of um, not seeing the way to changing from a very dominant patriarchal church to what it is now. It has changed, and it, but it's still far from um, being totally inclusive. And I used to get mad because in all parishes, and here too, the people who played the organ, the ones who did the flowers, the ones who cleaned the church, the ones who set up the sacristy or whatever, were always women. But, you know, I think I got that from my father. He couldn't stand that kind of, I'm the Lord of all attitude that seemed in those days to come from the priests. Um, so that caused a bit of ruction at the time, but it died down again because we got had some lovely priests as well. I'm trying to think. We also had, uh, I also belonged to a group where we, we did prayers. Uh, it was like a charismatic prayer group and we used to go over to the hall of the parish, of the cathedral then, and um, pray, you know. So, uh, and I, li I loved that. I loved because you got closer to the people who belonged to the prayer group. Well, we always had cantankerous parents, <laughs> but um, we also had fun activities. Like some of the sisters belonged to what was a sort of walking club, and we, we'd, we'd go and we'd go and walk for 15 k's when there was a 15 k walk on the go and that sort of thing. I remember once hearing about pupils who'd been here and the one said to the other something or other and she said if Sister Margaret would know that uh, she would have a fit and it was something like um, perhaps she'd had a boyfriend and wasn't married to him or something like that and you know and, and um, I don't think I would have had a fit but anyway. I'm still in touch with one of the former head girls uh, Ursula Brinkate, who works for the at the Jesuit, um, for the Jesuits at the Jesuit Institute, and her younger sister Therese was also a head girl. Their parents were were fabulous. We used to take the children on annual retreats, and we were down at Laverna on the river. Uh, there was 
the place there and we had the girls there. And there were four schools, all our schools. Um, there was Valcom, Springs, Whitbank and the School for the Deaf, St Vincent's. We were all together in the accommodation there and the four teachers who were with him, I was the one, ha had prepared this retreat for the children to last the whole weekend. It was usually a very good experience for the children. And on the Saturday morning, I was approached and told that my father had died. And one of the sisters, who wasn't in a school but had come to help give the retreats, said, take my car and you can go. So I drove to Clarkstall, where I came from, and he had died, my dad. And I'm so glad I was there because he had died at about 6 o'clock and I got there at about 10. And he was still there, they hadn't fetched him. But I did what the sisters did when someone died. We had a crucifix next to the bed and we had the rosary in the person's hands and I closed his eyes together with my brother who was there, my younger brother. And my father had a rose garden at the back of the house and there were 13 bushes because we were 13 children. A different coloured rose for every child and I picked these 13 roses and put them in a vase next to the crucifix. And you know, that was such a, a blessed experience for me and gave me such peace. Um, but I, say, I suppose in the convent you learn to live with life and death. I also found the convent terribly interesting. Um, I'm interested in woodwork and I make wooden toys. But there was a sister here called Sister Miranda. She was actually Austrian and she was the sewing mistress. And she had fantastic woodwork tools, uh, not woodwork, um, sewing tools, ne uh, needlework and all that sort of thing. And I said to her, Sister Miranda, when you don't use them anymore, do you think you would give them to me? You know, these all sorts of knitting needles and things. And she did too. So there was uh, interesting people among the sisters, if you know what I mean. They did a lot of embroidery in various convents, in Clarkstrip as well, and they sold it to the locals at a very decent price, and it was beautifully done, tablecloths and things. And people used to know, so they'd go to the convent and knock on the door, and they'd be shown this, and um, they'd buy it. Yes, they also grew their own vegetables. Here in Whitbank, I wasn't aware, because I only came in 1989, but they might have had their own, I'm sure, their vegetable garden. Um, and we, they had things like hens and uh, in Clark's Hope, cows. And two sisters looked after the cows and there was another one who looked after the bees. And I was just fascinated. You know, we were, we were right next to the squint spray in Clark's Hope, so they'd made uh, furrows so that we could get the water from the river to water the vegetables. It was a rich life in the sense that uh, the women who were the sisters, we say sisters, nuns were supposed to be enclosed, and we weren't closed, enclosed, but um, people colloquially use the word nuns, um, had many different hobbies and abilities, like sewing, like leatherwork, like um, to, you know, carpentry and so on. The first, our first sisters actually built some of the places where we settled in the Eastern Cape. The, you know, the, the pictures of them standing on uh, scaffolds and putting up whatever they were doing. So they were interesting people. Uh, yes, a lot of them were from Germany where they'd learned those crafts. There was a strong German connection because our foundress was a German woman. What happened was that in the Eastern Cape there were German settlers after the Crimean Wars and there was a strong German population there, many people. They were soldiers who'd been in the war. And the bishop there called Bishop Rickards, he wanted German people to teach the, the children of these settlers. So they approached our convent, which was in Augsburg, it's in south, southern Germany, and asked and they sent seven sisters, seven is a holy number, seven sisters to South Africa. They came to East London and they started in King 
William Stout. That's why we call the King Dominicans. And um, then the sisters spread. And that, when they settled, it was 1887 when they, the sisters came. And Whitbank started in 1924. So I'm just doing a sum. That's about nearly 50 years after we come to the country. Clarkstraw, where I came from, was earlier than that, in about 1902. But um, so that's why there was such a strong German influence, because those sisters established what they were then uh, enclosed. But early, later, in about 1920, somewhere, they became unenclosed, if you like. In other words, they could go out and into the schools. They used to go out when they first came, um, some of them to do the shopping and that, but they mostly stayed inside. But then after that, when they became people who could mix with the public and that, they weren't so strict about that sort of thing, about being enclosed. But we kept the proper, you know, the, the way we said our office and everything. We what's called um, a canonical order. We're not affiliated, like we're not a diocesan order. You'll find sisters who answer to the bishop in a diocese. We don't. We polite to them and say, Your Lordship, we'd like to establish a school here or whatever. Or, but um, ultimately, our congregation answers to Rome, directly to Rome. But there were other orders that, uh, other nationalities, Irish joined us, the Dutch joined us, English sisters came, Switzerland, and later on, even South America um, joined us. So we, we're dwindling now in numbers, but we, our sisters have also been from all over, but a strong German congregation. You know, there were sisters who found it very hard to retire when their time came. We had one sister here who we called the Eternal Scholar because she did one degree after the other as well as teaching. We, didn't, we weren't allowed to know about it, so we, we were supposedly ignorant of the fact that she was studying through UNISA, but she was a brilliant person and she got many degrees, but then the, they had to stop teaching when they were too frail, because the parents would say, we can't have that old <laughs> woman teaching our kids. So we'd, uh, you know, gently wean her out of the job. And um, this particular lady then, to my horror, started wandering around the convent as she was in her right mind, cleaning all the toilets. And I thought, what are you trying to prove that you can be, so have so many degrees and be an efficient toilet cleaner, you know? We used to have fancy dresses, uh, especially the night before um, we started Lent, you know? And then uh, we used to dress up, we used to dress up and come to this. And I'll never forget when I first entered the convent, I was sent to St. Vincent's, a school for the deaf, for a few months. And the sisters were fairly young then. And it was also um, fushing the night before we started Lent. <laughs> and um, the next thing, the music started, and these sisters started waltzing around the room, you know, <laughs> with sometimes in couples and sometimes alone. But I, my mouth fell open because I didn't know that the sisters were kind of um, into enjoying that. But they did. They loved it. Those were, you know, there was a lot of fun and a lot of storytelling. And um, when I said Manamish, it was so tough because this, that's when you were supposed to be, as it were, learning to be a sister. This happened and that happened. Then, then they used to say, that's nothing. You must hear what happened to us. And they'd go into intimate details of how strict their novice was. <laughs> I remember one sad story where we had a child who was in matric, and she used to ride, I think she rode a motorbike, a little scooter thing, and on her way home a car hit her, and she was um, mentally damaged, and she couldn't come back to school because she wasn't able. But the, the rest of the girls in that class were so horrified because 
you know, I was told, I had to tell him, no, this girl can't come back because of, she just can't make it. But she looked okay, you know, she recovered from the accident physically, but she wasn't okay because of, of her hand damage. And the girls resented it that, they, you know, they were cross with me because <laughs> one couldn't come back. But it was the only way we could cope. She couldn't have come back to a normal school. And I know if we go outside the front door and in the left-hand corner, I'm not sure where it is now, seeing that they've made this new building. And there was a, a little graveyard. Well, it was really a garden of remembrance because quite a few of the kids who died here, who died in Whitbank and were pupils there, a little memorial plaque was put in that garden of remembrance. And one of the trees here, which was an oak tree, the one on the corner, as you come up the driveway and turn right to the office here, I remember planting. And I also, and it's a beautiful oak. And the other one is over the road. I also tried to plant palm trees. And when the tradition of being having a lovely rose garden in the front of the school was also something I carried on, and so did Sister Lucia, who was the principal after me. And another thing I did at one stage, I don't know what got into me, but I kept birds. Um, and I built, I had a cage built near where the new science block is. Well, at that time it was new. And um, I had a lot of little small birds in there, and I used to look after them. That was for about two, three years. And I must mention the trees in um, the street behind us here, Fridge. Those trees used to, the, I'm sure they still have long roots which would block the sewage pipes. And then we had hijinks here because you know, it was very offensive and I had to call the plumber and it was uh, Brian Elliott's business and he'd come and he'd say, oh, sister, those trees. But Sister Cyril, who'd also been here for many years, over 20, former principal, she said to me, you are not to cut down those trees. So <laughs> I never did touch them. Yeah. Sisters got um, donations of things like from their families overseas in Germany, like the Stations of the Cross. And I remember they wouldn't, carved stations. And I remember the sister whose family had donated them when she was in a retirement home, St. Mary, she said to me, and what's this with moving the stations of the cross? <laughs> and apparently they had moved them temporarily to Brackpan or something. But they, I looked this morning, it seems they're back. They are back. I don't know if it's exactly the same ones, but um, there was, you know, a great helping hand given by the relations overseas. If, and they still do it. They, they'll collect money in their parishes and send them to South Africa to Sister So-and-so, who's our grandniece or whatever. Um, that's stopping because the sisters are dying. But, and, and then they'd use that money to, to help the poor in some way or other. I know that St. Gabriel's was built, that's the block where the little ones are. Um, that's changed, and then this block behind us here um, that was named after the wall downstairs where the, Mar the Marimas are, was named after Bernard Langton. And then the next block, it says St. Margaret. I'm not actually sanctified yet, but that was supposed to be in memory of me. So I haven't had a chance to look around, but this um, new building that they've made here, where I see there's a gymnasium, I would have loved that when I was younger, I believe is, uh, I'll go and see what it looks like, you know, and I'm keen to, to hear that. I'd like to say something about finance. I'm working in finance still uh, for the congregation, but it was a great thing because People used to think that, you know, the sisters could take them for nothing, or they didn't have to pay school fees, and to, to say no. Because as the sisters got older, we had to employ teachers, secular teachers who needed a decent salary. And there was always 
a kind of struggle to make ends meet. You know, we didn't take salaries. We we didn't take salaries, or if we did, it was an honorary sal salary, not a lot of money, but enough for us. But what was happening, you know, to eat it, sort of thing. But what was happening was that the school fees were getting higher, and that was normal. I mean, there was an evolution everywhere, and we had to employ more and more lay teachers. But uh, there was um, often a resentment that, uh, among some of the parents. They knew the education was good, but, you know, I hated that struggle of getting some of the parents who were loath to pay to do so. Of course, it wasn't fair on the other parents who were paying. But I'm so glad to see the school is uh, flourishing in that sense now, enough to build another building now. So yes, that was something special. That's one of our vows, poverty. And um, you, know, you don't go without clothing sort of thing. But your values are such that you are not, we do not believe in having unnecessary wealth. I have a, a Toyota uh, that I came in this morning, a, a little Toyota car, and flashing past me were these huge cars that people drive. I'm envious because the potholes in Joburg are terrible. I was coming to Whitbank and I deliberately, deliberately chose the road I normally come down and I thought, gosh, they've repaired a lot of the potholes around here, I think. But um, in Johannesburg, there's stacks of potholes, believe me. And if, if, you have, if you've got big tires, you add an advantage. But we drive these little, uh, these small cars, you know, and that's one of the ways. Like, no ways could we pay 500,000 rand for some huge car. Um, so that's one of the things. But it's not as if we run around with um, poor clothes, that's not the idea. We, we need to be presentable and decent. But we don't have lavish lives. We don't go on expensive holidays. And, uh, you know, long ago, the, when I was younger, they used to send us on sabbaticals. But the idea was to train you further to, to do the mission, to, to, whether it was nursing or teaching or... Um, we were talking about money. <laughs> and how sisters survived. In those days, uh, we got school fees. Later on, we had to pay salaries when we hired other teachers because the sisters got too old. And if there was any money over, we sent it into our central headquarters where it was um, put in some kind of a fund where some interest could be earned for when we were older and needed care. But long, long ago, we didn't actually have um, things like medical aid, we still don't have actually, or um, all sorts of perks and trims from financial uh, wherewithal. We were, we were hardy, and I think the sisters are still hardy, because uh, I think we belong to a generation where unless you were terribly sick or something. We survived. And I remember we had what we called chapters every four years where we set our direction going forward. We still have them. And uh, the average age about, I'd say three chapters ago, that's 12 years ago, was 79. And I was horrified. I would like to say we do have a website called the King Williamstown Dominican Sisters. And there is mention in that, on that website of a lot of the activities we've conducted since we came in 1877, since we came to the country. And a sister called Anne Wigley, who's a former uh, leader of ours, is busy writing the history. And I'm kind of helping, but I'm not writing. I'm suggesting and editing and not really editing, but any ideas I have. But there's a team writing our history. And also, we've got wonderful archives. 
which include Whitbank. So um, you always welcome to come and see to to make an appointment, and people do contact us because you'll get a phone call from somebody who says, my aunt went to Woodpain Convent in 1933 and her name was such and such. Um, have you got any information about that child, anything? And then we often find it because we kept annals, as they were called, in which you was, we were supposed to write any, in, anything of interest. So we did. And uh, in la the later years, the annals weren't kept so faithfully as a few of us were around. But um, there are things, and we do have what are called archives. If anybody knows of a very keen archivist without a job, we're looking for a new one because the, our previous one had to retire. So uh, the history of the sisters is jolly interesting. We came in 1877, and then a few years later, there was a call from Rhodesia. So some of our sisters left King Williamstown and went with Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes, uh, and a troop of his soldiers up to Bulawayo and eventually Salisbury. And um, it was interesting, I often speculate, because one of the stories goes that they kept fowls, which they uh, could, which could lay eggs for them, and also they would give them meat. But unfortunately, when they crossed the rivers, um, on one occasion, most of them were drowned, because this thing was slung below the bed of the wagon, in which the sisters slept. That's how the the soldiers went up with wagons and, and by ox wagon they travelled. And uh, the Rhodesian Dominican sisters were then established as an offshoot from us. We also um, sent sisters to Natal because the bishop there needed sisters and they became the Oakford Dominican sisters who are in Oakford in Natal. And an offshoot from them was the Newcastle Dominican sisters. So there are quite a few branches from uh, our Dominicans, but before us there was another group called the Cabra Dominicans who were primarily in the Western Cape. And uh, there's another uh, congregation that we kind of helped was the Montebellas, who are mainly Black Sisters Dominicans. So the, it's quite an in, in, interesting history, quite involved but uh, with lots of stories to tell and lots of adventures. So there's a lot about the history. Whitbank in particular, I think I remember most of it from my time. One of the things I, I remember was that there was supposed to be a borehole here. I, never, I don't know if they ever found the borehole, or <laughs> it must be on the, the old plans, because uh, it would be a source of water. and. This morning in Johannesburg, we had no water. So luckily, this is a camera and <laughs> not a device that has any uh, sniffing or smelling qualities or abilities. Yeah, so it's really a problem, no water. And there is a borehole at our home for the Down syndrome and mentally challenged women at San Salvador. And luckily, the borehole there is still serviceable, so we splitting the water from that borehole between St. Salvador and St. Mary's, which is where a lot of our old sisters are, not only. It's in the middle of Hyde Park, and that seems terribly extravagant, but when we bought the area there, which was for the Down syndrome uh, women, it was farmland. It was part of a, it was a farm. So, Hyde Park developed around it, so we're not there because we think we're rich. And that was in 1935, so it was 11 years after Whitbank. And originally those women with mentally challenged um, problems, they stayed with our deaf children, which they in Oxford Road at St Vincent School for the Deaf, which is literally opposite the zone in... Uh, in Whitbank, 
uh, in, uh, in Rosebank. So if you go to Oxford Road, which is well known in Rosebank, and you're travelling, say, towards Sandton, on the right you come to St Vincent's School for the Deaf. So we still have deaf children there and um, lots of them, boys and girls, also boys and girls, and uh, I spend some time there as, in my no as a novice. And I, one of my tasks was to take the children swimming on a Sunday. And then they would go into this pool and I try by gesturing to say, stay in the shallow end, stay in the shallow end, but they wouldn't, <laughs> they couldn't anyway. But they could see my gestures, but they ignored them. And I was always worried, oh, what am I going to do if any one of them gets into difficulties? I also had to take them for walks. And we'd get to the robot and I'd given them instructions, stop, stop when you see the light is red. But they ignored me and I was petrified because they couldn't hear the cars, you know. Not that it was that busy. Oxford Road now is a different story. <laughs> After I left St Thomas Aquinas, I went on a sabbatical, which I loved. That was in Minnesota, uh, in St Paul, one of the two twin cities, as they call them. And that was very, very exciting. Uh, it was sort of human development. And we had lectures on the scriptures, for example. But it was a lot, a lot of it was human development. And I liked it because it was interesting. There were only 13 of us there from all over the world and we were having this sabbatical which was lovely. And um, one of the interesting stories was they had what they called a van which was not a, quite a combi but it was a big vehicle and nobody would drive it because they were scared of it. But I'd, I had a license for a 26-seater which I'd got in Springs before I came to it back. And um, so I would drive, because uh, we sometimes had workshops in Minneapolis, and so we would drive, and I would drive, and I think they were sorry when I left at the end of that year because they didn't have a driver. That was a very interesting experience. Uh, we had sisters from all over the world, as I said, and one was from Vietnam. and. Um, she had had a very nasty experience during the, the Vietnamese War. Her family had tried to escape. She was safe in her convent, but uh, the boat they were in was shot at, and her family all drowned um, because they were escaping. So you know, she, her mother and her father, father and sisters and brothers, they, they all sh drowned when the boat sank because the boat was sunk by enemy fire. So we had the people there like that, you know, people from Brazil. It was a very, very interesting. They were all sisters, and um, we were we shared our stories and we got close to each other. So it was actually wonderful, wonderful, and we had very good people working with us. And after I'd done that, I came back again, and I taught again, and then um, I became what's called a bursa, the district bursa, which meant. I looked after the finances of all the individual communities. The sisters were tasked with um, budgeting, writing up the expenses and balancing the two at the end to so see that you hadn't overspent or underspent or whatever. And believe it or not, we were also challenged if we underspent because I said, well, you know, I was telling Trevor Barnes at break that um, at the opening of the pavilion, I was the principal and he was on the board and we were talking about cleaning in the school and he said, I see the swimming pool cleaning is un uh, underutilised. We budgeted X and you only spent this much. Is the pool dirty? <laughs> and I got such a shock because I thought I was being so good at not spending so much money. But um, so we did budgets in our communities and, and any money that was over, as I explained earlier, went to the general coffers, the pool that would help us when we were old. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and then I, I did that for 10 years and then my time there was up and then I, I was approached by the lady who runs the Catholic Schools office in Johannesburg. 
whom I knew well, Rosa Kalasa. And she said she was looking for a person to do the books. And I said, well, I'll try. And I've been there 12 years. But then one of our sisters who ran the congregational finances, it doesn't mean she does the books, she just keeps an overview. They approached me and said, could you do it? Because they had to stay to retire. She wasn't that well. So I've got my hands full. <laughs> Before the 1994 election, we were approached by the people who were, the IEB, I presume it was, and asked if we were prepared to be a venue. I was very nervous about that because I thought, oh Lord, all sorts of people coming into the, the school grounds and into the hall, which had to be set up for the balloting. But we said yes, and it was very interesting because I was petrified some damage would come to the hall, but it never, there was no damage. I was supposedly not allowed in myself except when I voted, but I did peek in and I was very proud of seeing, you know, our cross up there and our Dominican emblems and everything and our motto, Veritas. But what was fascinating was mingling with the people outside in the street. There were Afrikaans people, and they were saying, "What is he black? I can not have as a cluster here, a cluster nogal." And then another interesting thing: all sorts of people, black, white, all nationalities, and the queue went right around the block. And then I always admired them. Opportunistic people started up Coca-Cola stores. They brought Coca-Colas and ice and they sold them to the people or uh, hot dog stores because the people were hungry. I can't remember, I, perhaps they put uh, those toilet cubicles, you know, which they have at events, because I can't remember that bit. But nothing happened to the school. It, the hall was fine and I, I always feel very proud and remember the 24th of April 1994 so Thomas Aquinas School in Goodbank was where they had, uh, I don't know if they had any other places, they must have had, because it's a huge place, Goodbank, but that was a depot and there were stacks of people. Some had never, ever set foot in this place, most of them. When we started taking people of other races, I, when I came that was already the case. It was Sister Sophie Sirt, well it's S-I-R-C-H, Sirk a German sister, and I, I'd like to pay tribute to her because she had the courage to open the school. And I remember coming to teach the kids uh, in matric, and one of the girls said to me, because she saw me looking at her, she was light-skinned, she said, I'm coloured actually, sister, because she didn't, she could see I couldn't quite place her, she wasn't properly, she wasn't a white, but, and, um, but then we had the children come, and I must say, the teachers were fantastic. Some are dead now. But what we did was we took them in as young as four and we taught them English. And in each classroom, we had a few down there, um, there was also uh, another, uh, an, an African woman, a black woman, who could understand these children because they were four and they only could say, I want to go to the toilet in their language. But uh, so their English became very, very good. And that was, you know, our academic reputation became very strong. When we uh, became, as a school, when we became multiracial, it didn't happen suddenly. It was a gradual, a few kids at a time sort of thing. As people grew in confidence, they sent their children here. Unfortunately, a lot of the white parents actually left the school and they went to the local government schools. But um, we didn't mind, we just carried on. But it's true, we were prevented from, from participating with other children in the sports for, for a few years. But we always had a very strong musical ethos, very, very musical. Our kids were good at singing and the piano and you name it, recorder, violin and all that and the marimbas eventually and people liked that and they asked us to come and play at this event or that event and that helped. I was impressed by the opening of the pavilion 
because I saw um, the children were obedient, they were, they were excited, but when they were asked to keep quiet and the teachers asked them to, sh they did. And, um, you know, the, I spoke to one little boy and said, I couldn't see you. He said, well, I was at the front because I'm at a prefect, so I wasn't sitting up there. But um, we used to sit under uh, the canopies of the three different houses and um, that I sat where the teachers always used to sit, but I noticed that the canopy overhead was much more durable than in my town. And I also said to um, the Barnes family, I used to put chemicals in the swimming pool every night. That was my job, you know, because there was no one else here. And I'd go to the place where we kept the chemicals just near the end, get a cup or whatever it was and put it in the pool and I used to swim there often by myself up and down up and down in retrospect it wasn't such a good idea and uh, it was quite a challenge to teach some of our children to swim especially if they came from the townships they couldn't swim and I remember very clearly one little girl well, she was in about grade I'd say grade nine or something she jumped into the pool and she nearly drowned one afternoon, but we could rescue her. We also had a, a teacher here who, who was a diving instructor. I don't think we ever had a diving board at the side of the pool, but she was fantastic teaching the girls to swim. And well, that was difficult with the local schools to compete against them. We always had the interconvent schools. We had the interconvent tennis, the Veritas Cup, we called it, the interconvent swimming, um, and th that you know that was fantastic because we met with schools were in the same boat as we were. They were multiracial and struggling, so we were prepared to to drive all that way to try and yeah, get competition. When I came in, I noticed the tennis courts had been redone, a beautiful blue. And we had had them resurfaced at one stage. And I, I, I was always fond of tennis and played it and I taught tennis. So I taught the kids on that court. I, I, you know, I used to go in the afternoons and stand there and teach four ram and backhand and serve and lobby and all that. And um, also at the time we, we were friendly with the mine manager of the time and he had his children here, and he gave us a container which has been removed now, you know, one of those metal containers, and in there we, we stored our sports gear. So that, that, I looked this morning, I said, where, I thought, where's the container? But it actually looks better because by now it must have been quite rusted than that. Yeah, so I can't think of anything specifically. We always struggled with the kids going over the road to the sports field because of the traffic and we didn't want anybody to be hit in an accident. But overall I must say I loved uh, being at Whitbank. I had a bicycle and uh, Sister Benita also did and we used to drive a ride from here to the dam, Whitbank Dam, <laughs> on a Sunday and back again. But I don't think I could ride more than a metre at the, at the moment. <laughs> I did the Argus twice. <laughs> yes, I did, but then I, by that time, managed to get a better bicycle. It was a, you know, fat tyres, and, but I, I used to cycle, and I, I loved cycling, but I, I have had back operations, and um, so the, my knee is very arthritic, my left knee, so my balance isn't what it should be. But otherwise, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm very concerned if you listen to the news um, and also if you keep abreast of what's happening in the diocesan schools in the Joburg area because they fall under the Catholic schools office in Gauteng where I, I work. Um, some of them are doing brilliantly but they are, there's, the fact is that the people can't, the parents can't afford the fees so there's been a drain of children going to those schools. And um, we're still a long way from being fully accountable in our schools. You know, you'll still find corruption creeping in, just as in everywhere else. 
you know, if I think of Woodbank and the coal mines and ESCOM and all that, uh, I'm so horrified because I thought that we were doing such a good job here on the mines, although I didn't like uh, the supposed pollution. But at the same time, um, no, I don't know. I just don't know um, what the country's coming to. And lots of people are despondent. But I feel hopeful that we can still put our Dominican values, which are truth, um, loving people, spreading God's love for them, um, preaching education. Dominicans believe in education. It's a big thing for them, learning and education and studying. We can still imbue the children, those values in the children rather. And I think they uh, are grateful. Like if I, sp I spoke to a man today after we'd finished with the ceremony and he said to me, my daughter's a doctor. Do you remember? I brought my daughter here. She's now a doctor and she's now studying further. She's doing another specialised branch, branch of medicine. And there are lots of stories like that, um, where people whose children were here have um, done very well. I wanted to tell you about a girl who, whom I taught. Then she went and she became an accountant. And then she was sent here to audit the school, the, these books. And she sat there in front of me and said, Sister, you spent this pretty cash on this day. What was that for? Oh Lord, <laughs> it's uh, those shoes on the other foot now. But anyway, uh, I could explain it. But that was so interesting to to have one of my former pupils questioning the audit, <laughs> questioning me before the audit. Yeah, but it was a good time. I was younger and full of life, and I remember going to the matric dances. And I danced at the dance. <laughs> I loved dancing, so I did dance. And um, I loved the girls. We had, uh, you know, it, it, I initially knew the girls better than the boys because the boys were, got into high school, I think, after I'd left. But, um, or perhaps they were sort of at the beginning of high school, but I didn't know them very well. But I loved the girls. And we also had an old girls' society. Um, I don't know what's happened to them, <laughs> they're still going, but they used to meet and they loved it when the older sisters who, who had taught them came, because then they used to feel united and talk and all that. I would like to pay tribute to the teachers, some of them who were, and uh, when I was principal who were here, are still here, and um, they'll know that the school went through tough times not only with the, the multiracial problem, but with other internal problems. And that's a human thing. You know, we do have problems. But they were good teachers. And I don't know the teachers now. I know some of them, the older ones, and I take my hat off to them. They've done a marvellous job. So I'd just like to say thank you. Cause I, and also to the, the board over the years, and the principals who've guided us there, I can see Annette in this picture and, and um, people like Sister Lucia, Sister Cyril before, before that. You know, we had hard times, but we persevered. And the present staff also persevere. And we have loyal uh, people, like I'd like to mention the Barnes family, who've been with us for years and years and stuck with us and helped us to become financially viable and helped us with so many things and become our family. And uh, I'm very grateful to them and people like that. They're not the only ones, but we've got people like that who've been so good to us. And if you go outside and see the names of the head, girl, head girls on the board there, I think, gosh, yes, I remember those girls so well. <laughs>